today I will um, be doing, I'll be talking about the Battle of Badr, which is chapter 24. And last time we talked about the Constitution of Medina, which was chapter 22, and how the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa over 1400 years ago um, brought the same kind of justice and equality that nowadays we are fighting for. And we also talked about the um, that armed jihad is permitted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in self-defense from the Makkans who were increasingly becoming more aggressive to the Muslims. And we talked about the conditions of if there is jihad that um, no, no harm should um, come to any woman, children, elderly, farmers, laborers, religious leaders and that um, no, you're not allowed to destroy crops in the lands, trees and green fields and um, not allowed to destroy places of worship either. Okay, starting with chapter 24, Battle of Badr. The people of Makkah had forcefully occupied the houses and properties of the Muslims who had emigrated from Makkah and took over their land took over their lands so as we learned before when the muslims emigrated they left everything behind in mecca and what the people did in mecca is that they um started occupying their their houses and taking their property further they began to threaten the jews of medina and demanded that they force the muslims out of medina in order to intimidate the muslims and show their strength and power over them they sent a party of raiders and looters which attacked and ransacked an area of Medina used for grazing animals. They killed the shepherds and marched the herds of goats and camels to Mecca. This successful attack and raid from their part raised the nerve and ego of the unbelievers of Mecca and they became bolder. So they formally began making preparations to launch an outright attack on the city of Medina. The leaders of Mecca dispatched a unique and exceptional trade caravan to Syria under the leadership of Abu Sufyan so that they could finance and cover the costs and expenses of the imminent attack on Medina from the income generated from this trade caravan. When this caravan was on its way back, returning from Syria, the Holy Prophet Muhammad وسلم, invited the Muslims to go in its pursuits. Hence the Holy Prophet, accompanied by 313 of his selfless companions, departed from Medina. The Muslims had only one horse, one horse and 80 camels to ride on. And, the, and there were 313 of them and they had only 18 cam, 80 camels and one horse. And the rest of the soldiers had to, work, had to walk on foot. The Holy Prophet وسلم, appointed each camel to a group of three or four of the companions who would, ride the, who would ride the camel in turn. When the Holy Prophet had covered the distance of his turn, he himself would dismount from the camel so that the other person could ride on it. Both of his companions spoke out, O oh Allah's Messenger, please continue to ride the camel even when it's our turn. The Holy Prophet replied, Neither of you is stronger than me, nor is it the case that I am in need of reward and only you are in need of it. When Abu Sufyan received the news of the that the Holy Prophet had left the city of Medina and was on his way in, 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 in his pursuit, he sent an urgent message to Mecca that they should immediately come to his aid. The unbelievers of Mecca were stirred into action by this message and each person began to get ready to fight against the Muslims. Consequently, a large army of the unbelievers of Mecca consisting of 1,000 soldiers set off from Mecca being led by Abu Jahl. They had 100 horses compared to the one horse of the Muslims, 600 camels compared to the 80 camels of the Muslims, a troop of slave girls to sing and dance, and an ample amount of weapons and military gear with them. It is said that the Muslims were outnumbered by a ratio of 1 to 3. Meanwhile, Abu Sufyan's caravan had passed by before the Muslims had arrived and it reached an area where it could not be confronted by the Muslims. He sent another message to the people of Makkah that his caravan was now safe so that there was no need to continue the march and fight the Muslims for now. 
However, Abu Jahl refused to turn back to Mecca and boasted that they would continue on and teach the Muslims a bitter lesson at the place of Badr. Soon the Holy Prophet received news that Abu Sufyan's caravan had managed to move along swiftly and was out of reach. But the Quraysh of Bakr was steadily marching towards them with a large military force. So the Holy Prophet consulted with his companions in view of this latest development and changing situation on the ground. The noble companions replied, O Allah's Messenger, go wherever you decide, we will go with you. If you give us a signal to dive into the ocean or face up to the enemy, we will happily and anxiously sacrifice our lives. We are hopeful that Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will enable us to demonstrate such a fate for you which will bring coolness to your eyes. So please proceed with the blessing of Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. SubhanAllah. We will not give you the answer that the Israelites gave to the Prophet Musa salam when they said to him that he and his Lord should go and fight the enemy, but, but, they were not prepared to, but they were not prepared to fight and remain behind in comfort. Rather, we will, we, will say, we will say to you that please continue forward. Let us march with you and your Lord into battle with the enemy. Hearing their passionate sentiments, the Holy Prophet was pleased, and then he said to them, I can see exactly where the unbelievers will fall tomorrow in the battleground. So the Holy Prophet continued on his journey, heading towards Badr with his dedicated companions, and they reached the plain of Badr before the unbelievers had arrived. The plain of Badr is located around 80 miles from Medina. It is the day of Friday, 17th of Ramadan. On one side, there is a strong army of 1,000 unbelievers with extensive weaponry and military gear. And on the other side, there are 313 Muslims with a small number of swords and spears. The Holy Prophet held an arrow in his hand and was straightening the rows into battle formation. Any soldier who would be a step forward or backward from his line, the Holy Prophet would point to this arrow to straighten the row and not allow the formation to be broken. The Holy Prophet was walking in front of one of the rows and saw that Sawad was standing one step forward from his row. Perhaps he moved forward to kiss the Holy Prophet's hands. The Holy Prophet lightly pressed with his arrow on his stomach and said, O oh, Sawad, straighten yourself. Sawad straightened himself but then immediately said, O oh, Allah's Messenger, I have been hurt by this, so let me get even. The flag bearer of justice and fairness, the Holy Prophet, did not take this request as disrespect or as an insult. A mere soldier while standing on the battleground demanding something like this from the commander-in-chief, for this he was not punished or ordered to be court martialed. Rather, without displaying even a small sign of disappointment, the Holy Prophet lit lifted up his garment, presented his blessed stomach and said, O oh, Sawad, come and take your revenge. Sawad immediately leapt forward, embraced the Holy Prophet and kissed his stomach. The Holy Prophet asked, Sawad, why did you do this? He replied, O oh, Allah's Messenger, you are well aware of the situation that lies in front of us. It was my wish that before I die in battle, my skin touches your blessed skin. The Holy Prophet displayed his contentment at this wish and prayed for Sawad. When the two armies came face to face, three men from the unbelievers stepped forward, namely Utba, Sheba and Walid, and they challenged the Muslims to combat. So the Holy Prophet sent forward Hazrat Hamza, Hazrat Ali and Hazrat Ubaidah to go and face them. With their swords, Hazrat Hamza defeated and killed Sheba, and Hazrat Ali defeated and killed Walid. Utbah was also killed, but Ubaidah, however, was severely injured and succumbing to his injuries. He died placing his head on the feet of the Holy Prophet before he, before he passed away. The Holy Prophet gave him the glad tidings of achieving martyrdom. After this one-to-one -one combat, the two armies clashed with each other and a full-scale battle broke out. For a short while, the Holy Prophet went back to his command center, which was the spot where the Muslims had constructed a shade for the Holy Prophet at Badr. With great humbleness and profound humility, the Holy Prophet raised his hands in prayer and supplicated. O oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, fulfill your true promise. If these unbelievers overpower the Muslims today, then shirk, polytheism will dominate, and then your religion will not be established. This is because these 313 Muslims were the only Muslims at that time, and if they were to be defeated, then Islam would not spread. After praying to his Lord, the Holy Prophet returned to the battleground, picked up a handle, handful of pebbles, and threw them in the direction of the unbelievers. 
With his sword in his hand, the holy prophet moved forward, uh, moved forward and began to confront the enemy in battle. In order to help the Muslims, Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down thousands of angels. The, no the noble companion stated, At times when we would leap forward with our swords to strike the enemy, we would see that before our swords had touched the enemy, his head would be chopped and fall to the ground. Clearly, this was the effect of divine help from the unseen. As soon as the Holy Prophet joined in the fighting, the face of the battleground changed and the balance of power was over overturned. Experiencing defeat, the polytheists began to retreat and flee from the battleground. Seventy unbelievers were killed in this battle, including Abu Jahl, and seventy were taken as prisoners of war. The number of Muslims who were martyred were only fifteen, or were only fourteen. In this battle, the arm of Muaz had been almost completely chopped off, hanging barely from the shoulder. He came in the lofty presence of the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wa sallam, who placed his blessed saliva on his wound. The wound was miraculously healed and the arm completely cured and joined back to his shoulder. In this battle also, the sword of Okasha broke into two pieces, so the Holy Prophet gave him a dry branch of a tree and told him to fight with it. When Ukasha took hold of that branch and moved it a bit in his hand, it turned into a white metal sword. Even in the battles after this during his life, he fought using this, this same miraculous sword. It was also in the same battle that Qadada was, was severely injured with an arrow piercing through his eye, such that his eye was dislodged and began to drip down his cheek. The Holy Prophet called him and, and with his blessed hands wiped his cheek, placing his oozing eye back and put his hand over it. His eye was miraculously healed, such that he could no longer tell which one of his eyes were injured. A day before the battle, the leader of both worlds, the Holy Prophet, had inspected the battlefield. As the Holy Prophet would walk past a certain spot, he would point out the dead body of so-and-so would be lying there. Hazrat Umar Farooq said, By the one who sent our Prophet with the truth, the dead, body, the dead bodies of the unbelievers were not even a little bit, bit away from the place where the Holy Prophet had pointed out they would be. Although these people were the, were the worst enemies of Islam, nevertheless, the Holy Prophet did not tolerate that their dead bodies remain outside in the open desert to be eaten by wild beasts and birds of prey. Instead, the dead, bur the dead bodies were all buried underground in a disused well and covered up with soil. The Holy Prophet camped in Badr for a further three days, after which, when he was about to depart for Medina, he came to that well where the unbelievers had been buried. He stood near the mass grave and called out, O oh, unbelievers of Quraysh, if you had obeyed me, then you would not be in your present state of plight. You are very cruel relatives. You forced me out of my home, rejecting me. Other people gave me refuge, believing in me. Hearing this, Hazrat Umar said, O oh, Allah's Messenger, three days have passed since they died, and today you are calling out to them, how can bodies void of souls here? The Holy Prophet replied, you are not hearing what I am saying more clearer than they are. They are now listening to what I am saying, but they are, they are not able to answer. In fact, they are now convinced that what I was telling them before was the truth. After the battle, the Holy Prophet called a meeting to, to consult about the 70 prisoners of war that had been captured during the battle. Several suggestions had, were put forward, including that these oppressors be given the death penalty. The suggestion which the Pro Prophet of Mercy, the Holy Prophet, preferred was that each prisoner would be set free in return for a financial ransom according to whatever amount the prisoner could afford, and whosoever from amongst the prisoners could not afford to pay any ransom, he could teach ten children of Medina to read and write, and he would be set free. In order to be set free, 400 dirhams, silver coins, were demanded as ransom from Abbas, who replied that he does not have that so much wealth and cannot afford to pay this amount of ransom. The Holy Prophet stated, Dear uncle, what has happened to the wealth... <laughs> Sorry for that. What has happened... For what has happened to the wealth and possessions that you and my aunt Omar Fadl together buried in the ground and you told my aunt that if you were to die in battle then she was to give that wealth to your children. And hearing this the eyes of Hajjat Abbas, of Abbas opened and he saw the reality. 
He responded, Today I have realized and become aware that you are indeed the true messenger of Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because no one has knowledge of this matter other than me and Umar Fadr. SubhanAllah. <laughs> Um, this victory in the Battle of Badr was a major milestone in the establishment of Islam. And it was so important that those Muslims who fought at Badr became known as the Badri Sahabi and were very well respected Sahabis, not only among the companions themselves, but the Prophet Muhammad would um, give special love and affection to them and would give them special du'as and the best of provisions. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also mentions this battle in the Quran in chapter 3, Surah Ali Imran, verse 123 to 126, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala helped you at Badr when you were very weak. Be mindful of Allah so that you may be grateful. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues to say, it continues to reassure that to reassure Prophet that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will send 3,000 angels and even more, up to 5,000, to fight alongside the Muslims and help them win. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues to say, And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala arranged it so, as a message of hope for you believers to put your hearts at rest. Help comes only from Allah, the mighty, the wise. And indeed, it was a message of hope for the Muslims, as it strengthened the position of Muslims in Medina, and it presented Islam as a strong and viable force in the Arabian Peninsula. Whereas before, Islam was seen as weak and its teachings were ridiculed. And it also gave Muslims the hope that one day they will be able to return to Makkah and live in peace. As this battle proved that victory over the powerful and wealthy Meccan non-believers was truly possible. And this is a message of hope for us as well. That even when all the odds seem to be against us, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only one who can give us ease and victory on the condition that we stay firm on the enlightened path in spite of any tribulation we face.